Hello everyone and welcome to the first PCS Presents webinar. In this episode, we are joined by Ian Bell, CEO of PCS, and Alec Inez, partner at KPMG, who will be discussing all of the updates and latest developments about Basel 3.1. Uh, it's great to be here talking with you, Alec. Um, we're going to talk about Basel 3, 3.1, Basel Endgame, what yep. impact it's going to have on banks uh, going forward, banks particularly in Europe. So if you first introduce yourself and then... Thank you. Thank you, Ian. It's super to be here today and uh, to be talking about this very topical subject. Um, I'm a partner at KPMG. I lead our balance sheet optimization practice for uh, banks and insurance companies and also our, our treasury center of excellence in London. Um, I, I guess another experience that I have, which is really relevant for this, is uh, I've actually managed a bank's balance sheet um, with a standardized floor as well as advanced models uh, in Canada when, when I was at BMO. Um, I led their optimization practices there. And I, I think many of the lessons from uh, those practices will be applicable to to European and, and UK banks, and potentially to, to the US banks as, as the Basel endgame comes through. Excellent. So look, we've heard a lot about Basel, the final implementa implementation of Basel, as it's called in Europe, yeah. Basel endgame, as it's called in the US. We saw a very reactive, um, from the, a lot of reaction, sorry, from the, uh, from the US banks. How impactful will Basel 3.1 B for banks. Look, I think I think it varies from region to region, but it's definitely a significant Im impact. So uh, banks in Europe, in particular, uh, have struggled with profitability uh, er ever since the financial crisis. Um, and we'll put up a chart shortly that that really demonstrates that. But their price to book has been under one, which means that the sum of their parts does not add up to to the value that that, that is in the underlying bit. And they're cost of equity is roughly double what their return on equity is, which is not sustainable. Um, in Europe, there, therefore, when you bring Basel in, which is an extra capital charge, anecdotally, between 5 and 10% for most European banks and UK banks, um, all you're doing is making those banks less profitable for the same, same amount of business. Uh, in the US, uh, where they have not in really implemented Basel III, uh, they use CCAR instead. When you bring the Basel uh, 3.1 end, end game in, uh, in its current form, I should caveat it, uh, and, and say that anecdotally, most banks will suffer about a 20% capital rise without management action. Um, and uh, at least anecdotally, that's what we understand, which is why you, you, you can hear the likes of Jamie Dimon and others protesting very loudly. Because again, that, that translates instantly to a, a um, you know, 20% less profitable measure for your banks without actually doing anything differently. Um, I think the keys to this are driven really at a very high level by two things within the Basel rules. First of all, uh, on a standardized basis, uh, they're changing the risk weights of many assets. So, uh, and, and there's a bit of arbitrage there between different jurisdictions and how they're doing that, but the general direction is up. And secondly, uh, you, you have a floor. So if you're an advanced bank, you can take uh, no more than 72.5% uh, of the benefit uh, versus the standardized number. So you actually end up on both measures with with a potential impact, whether you're a standardized only bank or whether you're an advanced bank that has to adhere to both. Okay. So what does that mean for banks? I mean, how will this impact, or how is this likely to impact the way banks you know, manage their financial resources? So I think first and foremost, they're going to have to be far more dynamic in the way they think uh, about capital, uh, because most banks will have to adhere to two different standards. Uh, they're also going to have to optimize more because they're under under profit stress. Um, and what what does that mean? I think that means that internally you have to bring um, a, a greater understanding of what your financial costs are at any time and whether you are likely to be impacted by the floor or still be under an advanced regime if you're an advanced bank. Um, I think then you're going to have to be more dynamic in the way you allocate capital and drive through the organizations and really focus on that profitability measure 
rather than perhaps more traditional NIM-based measures of profitability. Um, I think you're going to have to reforecast more frequently, which probably means bringing uh, greater modeling uh, capability and, and predictive capabilities into, uh, into Treasury and more control of the balance sheet into Treasury. And then I think you're going to have to drive other tools uh, which banks currently think of as, as originate to distribute or more dynamism in the way they turn over their balance sheets to, to really drive return on equity. So I think there's a suite of things that banks are going to have to really focus on, manage differently, and that will represent significant cultural change for some banks. So taking all of this into account, are there any specific dynamics that banks are going to be having to be aware of when they're going to manage themselves under this new regime? Uh, absolutely, Ian, there really are. Um, in particular, uh, there's a new dynamic around a, what, what I think of as a portfolio effect. So um, effectively, as an advanced bank with the floor, you have to be very thoughtful about how you manage the blend of your businesses and the blend of those assets and, and the profitability mix, rather than simply focusing on, as you might have historically, what a profitable asset is coming onto your balance sheet, asset by asset. And that's because ultimately, uh, simply profitability of assets may not drive profitability of the bank as a whole uh, under this new regime. Um, we'll put up a a very simple example to demonstrate this. But in in everyday portfolio one, you've got two, uh, in the example, you've got two portfolios, one of which is a standardized portfolio, which is 50% of your book. Another one of is an advanced portfolio. Now, in the advanced portfolio, you have substantially less capital that needs to be put against it, i.e., it's a more profitable business line. You are not floor constrained, so you're able to take the full benefit of your advanced modeling. So in that scenario, very simply, you're able to achieve a decent return of say 6% return on equity um, between the two businesses. Now, if we take it to a hypothetically, a, a second a day two, where, where let's say you have sold uh, the standardized portfolio to, prof to focus on what historically would have been just the most profitable business, you actually end up floored. That means that the benefit of the advanced models is substantially reduced and your returns, therefore, even though you may be taking, um, in your mind, substantially less risk, uh, are substantially less. So they drop from what was 5.7 to 3.9%. Why? Well, that's because you have to put five times more capital against those assets because you're floored. Therefore, Banks, I think, have to be really much more thoughtful and much more analytical on a portfolio basis about what they do, about what M&A they do, about what businesses they prioritize, about where they are against the floor. Um, and, and I think that's really about how you grow your businesses as well, day to day. It can be about um, really dynamic management around that floor. Uh, and it can be using far more predictive models. It really underlines the scope to know where you are against uh, both the floor and advanced capital across your entire business and have more control to be able to drive things dynamically. Um, and rather than focusing on your balance sheet loan by loan, it really is across the totality and the total effect as it adds up, as well as, of course, those individual profitability measures. I mean, that suggests to me a very fundamental change in the operating models which banks are going to need to run going forward. Yes, I absolutely agree with that. I think the question actually we should be asking is therefore, where is hypothetically at least the efficient frontier? Um, and to our mind, very clearly, having worked through different scenarios, uh, and certainly the way we used to run it at BMO was uh, it's just above being constrained by the floor. So on a, on a um, really theoretical basis, uh, if I take an extreme example, if you are far above the floor, you're not taking full advantage of 
the fact that you have models, the fact that you are able to calculate appropriately the risk uh, in, in the assets you're taking. And so you have an overhead cost uh, to maintain that with the regulators that you're not taking advantage of. And you're not playing fully what, where you have a competitive advantage. You flip that around, and if you're very constrained by the floor, then there's no point in having that cost. You're putting, uh, I guess, in many advanced banks view, too much capital against the assets, as we've just discussed. Um, and so that means that actually where you want to be is somewhere just above the floor to take full advantage of the models. That The implication of that is that you have to be able to manage far more dynamically. So depending on how much of a buffer you want to run, you need to be able to think about real time which portfolios, whether they're standardized heavy or light, are growing faster. Um, and you have to manage your pricing differentially. So if, if you think about it in the simplest terms, am I unconstrained over the next you know, one, two, three, four quarters, or am I constrained in this business versus another business which, which may be standardized light? Um, and if you don't price like that, you will end up hitting the floor anyway because you, you will miss the market. Uh, where, where other people are pricing in that way. Um, so I think that's one, one key concept is where is the optimal zone and how do I stay there? What does that require? Well, it requires dynamic reallocation of capital and, and pricing models in real time. It requires a very clear understanding of your financial resources uh, and the cost of them, not just today, but into the future and projected into the future. So if my constraint today is leverage, but in a year's time, it's going to be the floor. If I, if I don't do anything, how do I think about that as a bank, as a bank management team, as a treasurer, as a CFO, et cetera? Um, it also demands far more active portfolio management. So one of the game ways to mitigate this, which you will be very familiar with, and I hope our audience are, are you know, tools like um, synthetic securitization, uh, could be tools like non-payment insurance as well on certain big assets, um, and other forms of hedging. So whether that's internally, uh, if you're a complicated bank, thinking about where my pots of trapped capital and or funding are and being able to move things around, or whether that's versus the external market to achieve capital relief, and I think you're gonna have to point your capital relief far more as well, whether that's I'm, con I'm worried about standardized relief, so do I choose a different portfolio, which may be standardized heavy? Am I um, worried about advanced uh, or just the cost of capital and driving returns? That may be a very different portfolio, or do I want both forms of capital relief in equal measure? That's a third portfolio. So I think those choices that banks are gonna have to make, and ultimately the investor community are gonna hopefully have to get used to and, and skill up for, bring different portfolios into the mix. Um, and you, banks and, and, and the investor community are gonna to have to develop a range of different tools. So, I mean, that seems like a huge change for most banks. I mean, they're gonna need some new modeling, some new approaches. Absolutely, I mean, I think it's twofold really. There's a, there's a cultural change first and foremost. Um, so I don't think banks can manage as they have done historically to them anymore. I think they have to be far more dynamic and predictive. Um, and I do think that uh, one has to be, have far more centralized control of the balance sheet. Now, what does that mean? That means a, a much more integrated model. Um, I think many banks have had elements of this in the past, whether that be, for example, a really good um, CPM function that thinks about model pricing for different uh, different businesses and pools or, or distribution, or whether that be on the treasury side in terms of predictive modeling. Very few banks have the entire suite joined together in the way they're going to have to. And I really believe that that starts with on a strategic level, uh, a difference in treasury, more skills in treasury, really detailed understanding of forecasting of allocation of financial resources as a whole, not necessarily in silos as, as has historically been done in some banks where one silo focuses on capital, another silo focuses on liquidity, a third may focus on IRRBB or whatever. I think you have to bring that 
far more dynamically together because through time you'll be constrained by different things potentially uh, and then you've got to drive those into the business with clear metrics uh, a decent portfolio management function a uh, product function will help you do that there are a number of players really redoing their balance sheet modeling at the moment to to think about how to implement that in the best way um, and then you have to to impose different disciplines so not every business should own its balance sheet is necessarily at all times the best holder of risk uh, depending on where you are versus the floor for example um, you also i think need to embed as a bank um, balance sheet velocity as a, as, a, as a real core hygiene factor so how often can i turn over those rwas within a year for example to be able to redeploy them uh, and earn the upfront fees and the servicing fees and et cetera to drive returns. Uh, how do I think therefore that feeds into origination standards? How do I think about it for pricing of different products? How do I think about dynamically ensuring I don't hit the floor if I don't want to? Um, and how do I hedge my balance sheet appropriately? So I think all of that requires significant change and a, a, a different operating model and different skills which banks have in pieces, um, but not have not necessarily successfully knitted together yet. Uh, it seems to me that at the risk of using one of the most horrible words in the English language, you do need more of a holistic, integrated and portfolio management model. You absolutely do. Um, and I think that the bigger the bank and the more you know, international it is with different regulatory regimes overlaying different balance sheets, the harder that can be. Um, so not only do you have to think about managing regionally within uh, rules of that region and perhaps capital add-ons that may be there, but then you have to have that aggregated portfolio view and you have to have a common language between the two, which says, how do I drive the best result for the shareholder as a whole? How do I drive efficiency both internally and externally um, and really have a clear vision of, of how I understand that. Now you mentioned recycling RWAs, you even mentioned securitization which of course is a word which is close to our heart here at PCS. Uh, how does securitization fit into this and what are you seeing in the securitization space in the context of, of Basel 3.1? So look I think SRT is a core uh, tool for banks, uh, whether STS or, or old style, if you like. Um, it is a, a social good for the banking sector, in my mind, uh, and it's going to become an increasingly important tool uh, for banks to manage capital. Uh, when you are constrained by capital of whichever variety, you are, it, it is a great way of, um, if you like, recycling capital to be able to redeploy and support those clients in those core businesses. You are taking risk out of the banking system, giving it to uh, paid professionals who have specifically raised money to take it. Um, and, and ultimately, I think what it means in a Basel 3.1 context is it's going to be more widely used or have to be. Um, I think banks are going to have to be more differential in the way they choose their portfolios. Historically, we have a number of core portfolios which have worked well under Basel III. Um, with a standardized floor that you have to manage at the same time, a bank is going to have to be more thoughtful about, am I targeting standardized floor relief predominantly? Am I targeting advanced relief predominantly or a balanced approach? depending on where they are in the cycle. This will bring other portfolios in as relevant, whether they're heavier or not. So it might be uh, mortgages, for example, which I think we are seeing some trends in, in the STS market in Europe. Um, so there will be other asset classes that banks will find attractive to securitize. I think the market is going to have to evolve both for larger demand, um, particularly as the US comes on stream, uh, but also for different asset classes. Um, because through, through a cycle, banks are going to have different needs uh, and they're going to have to be much more dynamic in the, in, in the way that they, they manage their portfolios. Now, securitization and SRT both have an awful lot of regulation around them, what can be done, what cannot be done. 
What's your assessment of, of that regulation currently? Is, is it a help? Is it a hindrance? A bit of both? I, I think ultimately it's a bit of both. Look, we, I, think, I think everybody will know the background at post-financial crisis where securitization had a really bad name. Um, I think the current structures have been evolved with regulatory blessing uh, to be safe and, and do what they say on the tin. So I do think that at times there's still conservatism among certain regulatory bodies, um, which is understandable. And when you use this as a tool, it has to be done in a safe and secure way. Um, and I, I think that m the market has predominantly evolved that way, particularly the cash market where you, you receive as a bank, if you like, your hedge payment up front uh, in a secured way. So I, I think that um, there's a, a real debate right now among different regulators about the P factor, as we know, to ensure that securitization stays as a relevant tool. Um, you know, Europe has taken one approach. The PRA paper uh, most recently has proposed a second approach. Um, they both have validity, I think, um, to preserve a market which uh, has a social utility and is very valuable both to banks uh, and to bank regulators. Um, the interesting additional take now is, is how the U.S. comes into this market. Uh, you know, there have been proposed changes to the and, and changes made to the regulation in the US, how they will fit with the Basel III end game with all the lobbying going on in Congress in an election year will be interesting. Um, they are promulgating a slightly different model in the US. Um, but I believe you know, the Fed has recently also blessed more European style CLN structures in the last week or two for several banks saying that they're equivalent to the new regulation. So I'm seeing positive moves by the big three regulators to really um, embrace STS and synthetic securitization, one or the other or both, um, as, as a useful tool. And long may that continue because I, I fundamentally believe in it as, as a good tool for the, for the market and to manage risk prudentially. So if I'm a bank, I'm looking at Basel 3.1, I'm trying to see how I could do some SRT. What's your kind of advice? So I think understand your baseline first and foremost. Uh, really have an understanding of what your financial constraints are, where, if you like, the market is and the opportunities are in terms of a market understanding of risk versus the regulatory understanding of risk point in time at, in the context of your own balance sheet and what you're trying to achieve. That requires, as we've discussed already, a, a different model and far more um, predictive models, I think, a different operating model and more predictive models. Um, I think then the way to do this safely and in a way that regulators uh, are blessed have blessed in other places is really to think about your operating system for securitization and to remove as much uh, as many manual processes as possible where operational risk can come in. Um, we've seen regulators increasingly uncomfortable where banks have not done that, uh, particularly as, um, if you like, the number of trades grow that you use to hedge your balance sheet. Um, and become more significant to your capital ratio. So I think there is a, a model in which one has to operate these things with some investment um, and in a dedicated way as part of a, a portfolio function in the way we've described. So if you were to summarize, there's a lot here, right? <laughs> uh, but if you were to hit the high points, what would your summary be for people to take away? So I, I, I think I'll probably limit it to a very few points. Point number one, uh, Basel 3.1, the Basel 3 end game uh, ultimately makes profitability more challenging for banks globally. Two, banks are going to have to be far more dynamic in the way they think about capital uh, because they have two capital standards to work with now and a portfolio effect to deal with, uh, which is different fundamentally from business as usual as it has been. That leads to investment 
uh, an integrated portfolio and financial resource management model and ultimately moving away from NIM-based measures towards return on equity-based measures and more centralization of the balance sheet. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. Thank you for joining us for PCS Presents Basel 3.1. For more information and to see more of our resources, please follow the links in the description box below to the PCS Great Library and for today's presentation slides. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we hope to see you next time.